Welcome, everybody. My name is Hadar Harris, and I am the executive director of the Student Press Law Center. I want to thank the student organizers for Trust Falls, and in particular, Ramey Charles, who helped gather the star-studded panel that you're going to hear from tonight. Trust Falls is a project that raises awareness about the crisis of trust in mass media, but the program also raises funds for the BCC High School Education Foundation. You can see uh, their mission is in the program for tonight, and you can find their website address being dropped right now in the chat. So please support their work and the great work that student journalists are doing at BCC. I'm here because tomorrow is Student Press Freedom Day. It's a national day of action to let people know about the very important work that student journalists do and the challenges that they face. The theme this year is journalism against the odds. This year, student journalists had a front row seat to the stories of our day, reporting on the rapid move to distance learning that affected almost 73 million students from kindergarten through graduate school, plus their teachers, plus their families. It totaled about a third of the entire US population. They covered racial justice protests and reckoned with racial justice issues in their own communities. They covered the election where young voters had such an important role. And yet they did all of that in many places under a threat of censorship, of prior review, or of budget cuts that also served to censor their work. Yesterday, we celebrated the anniversary of the Tinker decision, which said that students' First Amendment rights don't stop at the schoolhouse gates. And yet in 1988, the US Supreme Court created a free speech exception for student journalists through the Hazelwood case, which said that public school administrators could censor student journalists work for any legitimate pedagogical concern, which is pretty much interpreted for anything that they don't like or could be controversial. This has led us down a very ugly path of censorship and prior review in many schools. That's not what being a journalist is all about, and that is certainly not what evokes trust and press freedom. So Student Press Freedom Day is a day to shine a light on that inequity and to call for nonpartisan state-based protections, new voices laws, to allow student journalists to practice their craft without the threat of censorship or intimidation. Tomorrow, you're gonna to see op-eds on CNN.com and Newsweek and student and non-student newspapers across the country. You can check out uh, www.studentpressfreedom.org or the SPLC website for more information. And so now that you all are aware of Student Press Freedom Day and the way that that could link to these discussions about trust, I get to introduce a student press freedom hero and one of my own personal heroes. Jamie, I'm getting ready to introduce you. There is no one who has been more supportive of efforts like New Voices and supporting student press freedom than Congressman Jamie Raskin. It's my honor and my pleasure to introduce you to my former colleague and my friend. All of America knows Congressman Raskin because of the way he led his colleagues with brilliant lawyering living out his love for the Constitution and demonstrating his faith in the future of America in plain view during the impeachment trial just a few weeks ago. But Jamie Raskin has lived out this love of country and his faith in the future through all the work that he's done for so many years. Nothing more important than the support that he gives to students, to high school students, journalism students, and law students, not only through legislation, but by developing projects like one of our personal favorites, the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project that he started at American University, Washington College of Law, where we taught together. And the support that he gave for New Voices student press freedom laws in the state of Maryland when he was a state legislator. As a member of Congress representing the 8th Congressional District of Maryland, Jamie epitomizes all that is good in government. And as a person, he embodies all that is good and true in humanity. And so here to talk about his recent experiences with the trust gap is my friend, the Honorable Jamie Raskin. Hadar, thank you very much. What a pleasure to be with all my friends at BCC um, and uh, with Ramey Charles. And uh, Hadar, I'm moved by your comments. You know, the very last bill that I was able to 
get past in Annapolis before I left the Maryland State Senate was um, was essentially codifying the Tinker decision, saying that um, you know the presumption is that students can publish unless the administration can show that the work is materially disruptive of student discipline and education. And so I think that that has helped to kick off uh, some other legislative efforts like that in other states uh, as well. And you're right to point out the importance of the great uh, Tinker decision uh, and its anniversary yesterday. And of course, Mary Beth Tinker is still out there, our friend fighting for the rights of students and for the uh, political engagement of students too. So um, <clears throat> I think this is a, a thrilling uh, topic. Uh, there's obviously a fundamental relationship between trust and truth. And um, we have gotten so far away from the truth in our country that it has uh, eroded the bonds of trust, as well as the, the bonds of affection that Lincoln talked about that were so central to, you know, maintaining the cohesion of society. So we've got to get back to the habits of telling the truth rather than lies and propaganda and deception um, and undermining people's belief in things based on falsehood. Um, and um, I remember when I was in school, I read this wonderful passage in um, Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations where he said that the, the truth of an analytical proposition is determined by the logic of its terms. The truth of an empirical proposition is determined by its correspondence to reality, whether or not it is a fair description of the world as it exists. But the truth of an ethical or political or moral proposition is the courage with which we act in the world to make it real. So I just, uh, my only message to the students is to search for analytical truth, to make sure the things that you're being told have a logical structure to them and exclude fallacies. And I, I hope that they're still teaching fallacies in school. And um, I, so you can recognize them and identify them and purge them. Um, and I hope that um, you will recognize the truth of empirical statements by testing whether or not it's a legitimate empirical proposition and that you will make true the ethical and moral and political propositions of our constitution, our declaration, and our democratic culture by the courage with which you act in the world. And with that, I will yield back to you and wish you guys a really great seminar tonight. And I wish I didn't have so many other things to do, otherwise I would join you. E Eli, that, Eli and um, Kim, thank you so much. Uh, Congressman Raskin and David, thank you very much, and thanks for uh, organizing it. And hello to my friend Carrie Wofford. She just uh, sent a note, so thank you all. Thank you, Eli and Kim. You have the floor. Uh, Professor Whaley, you're muted. Muted. Um, I want to join everyone in uh, thanking Representative Raskin for those remarks. It's a tremendous honor. He is an American hero in our midst um, for many reasons. I had the privilege of interviewing him back in November. I have an, uh, an Instagram show called Simple Politics that's about breaking down concepts into regular language for people. So if you want to hear more of Jamie Raskin, we spoke for 45 minutes about the Constitution and the election. It was really exciting. Um, so I'm a law professor at the University of Baltimore, and I actually am also a mom of four daughters, uh, three of whom, two who graduated from BCC, one who's still at BCC. And so just let me take this rare moment to thank Mr. Lopolato, um, who as an educator myself, I could say he's really an extraordinary person and such a gift to the school and the community. Um, my my uh, second child uh, was involved in opening museums with him when she was at, at BCC, and now uh, he's put his finger on what I think is the biggest challenge for American and basically global society in addition to climate change, which is what do we do about the massive amount of misinformation and, and the stuff that comes into our phones that's buried there or, or targeted there with algorithms um, that are supposed to be tailored to things that uh, we already might believe. It's really a dramatic a change in society. Um, I believe I, I personally think the number one 
a remedy or at least step one is civic education, which is why you all are here. Um, I've written a couple books, one called How to Read the Constitution and Why, one called What You Need to Know About Voting and Why. Uh, and so all of you should continue with, as, as uh, Representative Raskin said, uh, challenging assumptions and also getting to the point where you can tolerate uh, lack of, co of consensus and you're curious about the other side's point of view and not just jump to a team and defend your team. I, I just can't overemphasize that. And a primary element of that is integrity. And I think uh, Representative Raskin mentioned that. Use your common sense and what the value system you learned at home and at this school uh, to make these hard decisions, uh, particularly when it comes to politics and also with your media diet. So those are my opening remarks. Uh, thank you for having me. I want to turn it over to um, my cohort here, Eli Glickman, who is a senior at BCC, and we've been working closely together uh, to um, put together and uh, finalize this panel. And I'm so excited. We have an extraordinary, extraordinary lineup. And it's really a pr pr privilege to have all of these uh, very prominent people to talk to us tonight. So Eli. Thank you so much, Professor Whaley. And I just first want to echo everything um, uh, Professor Whaley just said with regards to um, Congressman Raskin, um, and especially to Mr. Lopalato, who really is uh, just just a cornerstone of the BCC community and has been so instrumental, um, just speaking to my own experiences and my sort of evolution as a writer for the paper and has just been such a help to everyone in the community. Um, with that said, um, I want to welcome everyone to the final panel of Trust Falls, which is a symposium hosted by BCC High School on America's falling out with mass media. Um, there will be time at the end for, uh, for our panel to answer questions from the audience. And I just want to ask that um, all questions be directed to either uh, myself or Professor Whaley via the Zoom chat um, privately. Uh, uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce our five panelists. I'll preface this by saying that the introduction will be brief because each of our panelists has incredible accomplishments um, that would take me a very long time to read in full, and we're trying to um, have as much time for the discussion as possible. So with that, um, in no particular order, um, Dana Bash is CNN's chief political correspondent and co-anchor of uh, State of the Union with Jake Tapper and Dana Bash. She also uh, covers campaigns and Congress regularly. Um, Juan Williams, Juan, Juan Williams, excuse me, currently serves as a co-host of Fox News Channel's The Five and also appears as a political analyst. And he's also worked at the Washington Post and NPR and regularly writes for a host of different media outlets. Um, Gretchen Carlson is an internationally recognized advocate for women's rights whose bold actions against Fox News chairman Roger Ailes helped pave the way for the global Me Too movement. A.B. Stoddard is an associate editor and columnist at Real Clear Politics, where she has covered the U.S. Congress since 1994 for the state news service, The Hill, and as a Senate producer for ABC News. And lastly, Rick Burke, who is the co-founder and executive editor of STAT. He, helped, uh, he spent most of his career at The New York Times, where he was the chief political correspondent and covered beats, including Congress, the White House, and national drug policy. Thank you all um, for being here to participate. We're so thrilled to have the opportunity um, to speak with you this evening. Uh, so the first question is for Juan. Um, I'm a high school student who cares deeply about the major issues facing the country, but the information coming over social media and fed into my phone can feel overwhelming at times. I know I'm speaking for lots of people my age asking, what can I do to manage the information I absorb to ensure it's accurate and balanced when algorithms feed people data based on perceived preference and ideology? Well, thank you, Eli, and thanks, Kim. Uh, Miss Whaley, I should say. <laughs> um, you know, Eli, I think your question has built into it a sort of contempt for journalists. And I think it's, it's well earned in some ways. I think when I look at the polls, you know, if it wasn't for morticians and TV evangelists and used car dealers, I think journalists would be at the bottom of the trust barrel in American society today. Both sides, liberal and conservative, any side you pick on that political spectrum really has trouble uh, with what's going on with, in journalism today. Uh, it strikes me that, you know, it's so much a matter of how you consume the news, because in your question, your description, you were a passive person absorbing uh, the result of algorithms, determinative uh, output for your phone or your computer. And let me just try to change that way of viewing the news for you, because I think the answer to your question is about you becoming more active 
uh, not simply a passive consumer of news, but someone who is going after information. Um, you know, I do TV uh, these days more so than uh, print. And so people recognize me, come up, and oftentimes, whether it's at the train or the airport or at the ball game, uh, they want to tell me the error of my ways, how silly I was to say that, or why don't I know about this, et cetera. And just as they get, get going, I always say to them, just tell me, this kind of like I want to do um, an MRI of their media uh, intake. And I say, where do you get your information? And it can be very revealing, Eli, because people will say things like, uh, oh, I, I listen to NPR, I read the Washington Post, and uh, if I have on cable news, it's uh, you know MSNBC or CNN. And then I immediately know, okay, I know who I'm talking to, and I know where they're coming from because of their media input. Now, let me just tell you, the other half of this, given that I work for Fox, is people will say, oh, no, I watch Fox. I read the Wall Street Journal. I love their editorial page. Um, or, and they'll say, you know, I, before he died, I'm a big Rush Limbaugh listener, right? Uh, and if it's a matter of social media, you'll get one group that will say, I'm all about Drudge and Breitbart, and the other people will say, I'm with Huffington Post and, you know, the New Republic or something like that. So you see immediately a tremendous split in terms of that input. And of course, I think it then forms their thinking for them. And I'm not always sure they're aware of the inputs and the consequence it has on the way they view the world. And what I was saying to you earlier, Eli, is I think you should be conscious of these inputs, not just critical of them in terms of that's what they do, but that you have to cross certain lines in terms of pursuing information if you have an interest in a story, an idea, a piece of legislation, something that's going on in your neighborhood. When I was a young person, the reason I wanted to do journalism was that I was interested in how power operates in America. So it wasn't that I was taking you know, one side of a partisan political feud between left and right and therefore getting information from one side and the other. I wanted to know as a kid growing up in New York City, well, why did the trash get picked up in certain neighborhoods? Why do certain people have good public schools? Why do the police approach certain people as fellow citizens, but other people as suspects? And I thought, this is how power operates. I want to know how power operates in the world. So the framework I brought to seeking information, to reading the news, is a little different than Republican versus Democrat, left versus right. And it forced me then to pursue information a little differently. For example, I would read books, not just rely on media, uh, you know, daily media, but, you know, given my age, I'm going to take you back a little bit, Eli, but, you know, I read a book, I remember thinking this is an example of how power works, because it was written by a man named Teddy White, and it was about the making of the presidency in 1960. And he took you inside what they used to call the smoke-filled rooms of the political bosses and hacks and the politicians to see what was really going on. You know, similarly, I mean, I, I was a big fan of David Halberstam. And David Halberstam, he covered things like civil rights, but also the Vietnam War. And to understand how power worked in terms of the war, he wrote a book called The Best and the Brightest, which was about, again, how the policymakers put in the input to try to come up with what was obviously a failed war policy. And even today, you know, you can read books about the media, I, you know, Howie Kurtz, Brian Stelter, they've written fabulous books on the media. But again, it takes you inside the power behind those algorithms, the power behind those websites and the like that are feeding the information that are forming people's political views. And when you ask me, Eli, well, then how can you trust any of it? I think you've got to take that broader, more critical approach to how power works and apply it to media, apply it to yourself, 
so that you're not a passive consumer, but you are an engaged consumer when it comes to news. Great, thank you so much. Um, and that's certainly um, a perspective I, I appreciate, and and I definitely definitely agree that um, one of the best ways to consume media is to to look at what what underpins it in terms of power, in terms of perspective, and 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 try to broaden um, that. So. Um, all righty. So the next question is for uh, Dana. Um, so I'd like to ask you, how has journalism changed over the course of your career? Um, and what, what do you think has been the catalyst for this change? And yeah, yeah, just that. Technology, first and foremost, in every single way, and uh, for, for, for good and bad. And, um, you know, when I first started, uh, at CNN in 1993, there was like barely email. And um, we were the only cable news network. And there was definitely, there was, you know, the, the internet, you know, Al Gore had just invented it. So it would like barely existed. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a joke for the older, for the older set here. Um, but uh, so, so, you know, you, you really, when I started, it was, the, the wire machines in the newsroom that made the noise, you know, and uh, and you had to use actual phones, sometimes pay phones, cell phones were just starting. And the difference between that and where we are today is like light years. I mean, a lot of people on this call can, can relate to that. Um, you know, you actually had to find somebody, uh, which I think still helps today with reporting. Let's say you go to Capitol Hill, you have to physically find somebody uh, to ask a question as opposed to sending a text. Uh, you, and that's the best way to do it. You still went through people's assistance to get to them and that is kind of you know gone by the wayside. Um, but technology has changed in terms of how we report. Uh, and obviously how we consume information. But let me just start with um, the, the act of, uh, of getting television on the air. So I'm actually right now in my basement and you can probably see this screen behind me. And this is new like in the last year, um, this, and this is pandemic driven. I can be on television from my basement in a way that you don't really even know where where I am. And it's because of, of technology, because I don't need a giant satellite truck to drive into my driveway in order to hook up, in order to get to the satellite, in order to get to your television sets, because we have technology called, you know, it's, it's basically cell phone technology. It's called a live view that's hooked up here and it can, it can be me uh, back to, to CNN and get me on the air. It, it is remarkable uh, that we could do that right now. Thank goodness that we can do that now in, in a pandemic. But if you go back in time, I mean, you know, slowly but surely it became easier and easier to communicate. And then it went at, like at warp speed. Um, that has been good. It has been good because it, is, it has allowed us to e more easily communicate with sources, communicate with one another in gathering news, and of course, get information out to, um, to viewers, consumers, customers, uh, you know, readers, however you want to put it. The downside of it is kind of what, you know, what Juan was just talking about, that technology has contributed to uh, the compartmentalization of of news because you don't, you as a news viewer or a news consumer, don't, you have more options. And, um, you know, way back before I was uh, obviously at CNN because it's cable, uh, you know, people got their news from television on the network news. They read the newspapers. Um, they did listen to, to talk radio, but that even that is relatively new. And, and that was it. And so people could, generally speaking, agree on the same set of facts. And now you can, you know, seek out your own echo chamber and you can very easily get tricked into a set of facts that you think are factual, but are not, are really just opinion and, and sometimes actual downright conspiracy these days. So, you know, 
all of the good things that allow us to communicate more easily, that allow citizens to be involved more easily, has absolutely um, contributed to some of the, um, you know, the, what I consider the, very much the downside of, uh, of technology, whether it's, you know, on Twitter or other social media. Uh, again, I use Twitter as a news feed. I think that's a plus for me. The downside is Twitter trolls <laughs> and, and, you know, people who, you know, I have to mute or block because I just, uh, I just don't want to hear it anymore. I think overall, it's a good thing. Overall, it's changed much, you know, for the better because it's made us much more, um, it's made us as reporters, it's made it much easier to do our jobs and it's better uh, to have all of the options with technology, but there definitely are downsides. Hey, thank, thank you um, for sharing that perspective. Um, yeah, and, and I certainly, in, in my sort of limited experience as growing up with this technology and the internet and all this, have definitely um, noticed, noticed what you're talking about. In that same vein, um, I'd like to ask um, AB a question next. Um, and, and it's sort of, sort of a, a combination of, of, those, of those two previous questions. So um, given that there's this shift towards more kind of technology-based, entertainment-based opinion media, and that it can overwhelm so many people, particularly young people, because they don't really know where to look, you know, what, what's, what's your perspective on that? Um, and how, what, what advice do you have to people who have, have gotten overwhelmed by, by the, just the onslaught of opinion-based media? I want to thank you, Eli. You've been great. I don't want to make you cringe, but you're a very impressive uh, young man. I want to uh, thank everyone for having me. It's really great to join my colleagues in this discussion, which I think is really important, particularly for people your age. I am the beyond proud mother of two BCC graduates and a, high, a BCC senior, Lily Roberson, and her twin brother and sister, Anna and Nick, are off at college. Um, and I'm very grateful for the BCC community and the leadership of Mr. Lopalato. And again, what a gift to have Congressman Raskin, who has led us by his example through the roughest two months of his life. Uh, and I, I think it's just amazing that he was able to participate tonight. Yes, we basically have never had more information and we've never been less informed. Um, the, the question of what the government could do about this is what I'm gonna walk you through. Um, and this is, you know, I had to prepare for this, it's a little clunky. The caveat is I'm not an, uh, an expert on libel law or first amendment issues, but um, you can get to the light stuff with me later in the Q and A, but I wanted to kind of take people through what's going on here. There are a host of issues facing big tech right now. And the pressures are not only about disinformation and misinformation, but on the fact that they have this increasingly monopolistic power, blocking out the ability, buying up their competition and drowning it out, essentially. So that's, that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have this censorship question. So most experts on tech, which I'm not, basically agree that big tech cannot be regulated and that the way that we get out of this is to create incentives for them to be more transparent and more accountable. So it took a long time for Twitter and Facebook to go from A, starting to flag the lies in Trump's tweets, to then B, suspending him for, provoke, for posting content that provoked violence, and that happened only after a deadly attack on the government. So it's hard to imagine them adopting a one-size-fits-all process to approach every one of our posts. Uh, in the future. So what the, what the experts that uh, I ha have found most compelling in their arguments say is that we, social media uses, they com the companies use maximum user engagement to make their money. So there's a lot of artificial amplification, amplification and sort of virality that spreads disinformation. And so a lot of this is, oh, you know, it's, we know algorithms are intentional, but it, it's very intentional because it, this maximum user engagement makes them money. So if government can create mechanisms that will, uh, first of all, government can't be trusted to censor or regulate free speech or attack or anything, anything that government decided any truth tribunal wouldn't be trusted. So the government needs to come up with a system that creates incentives 
if, um, on these platforms so that we have um, more um, credibility, uh, more accountability and transparency in the marketplace, that it's not something that's a dictate uh, from the government. That said, um, I really want to press with this audience of um, young people making their way through this kind of moment that this disinformation and misinformation crisis is so real. It is growing. It is a burgeoning threat, not only to governance and democracy, but it has the potential to produce more violence and truly destabilize society at multiple levels. In the last year of your life alone, you have seen misinformation and disinformation rock this society and this country about the pandemic, what was true and not true, about the election, about vaccines, and now about January 6th. Um, this is all protected speech and Congress cannot curb it. Um, and so you have this interesting thing happening now in Congress where Democrats are writing to the presidents of Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, Cox, Dish, implying that those carriers, those companies should no longer carry Fox, uh, One America News Networks and Newsmax um, or require that they alter their coverage in some way because of misinformation that directly led to the attack on the Congress January 6th. Uh, and so those members, Malinowski and Eshoo, are coming under fire from conservatives um, because this, again, is protected speech. Unlike broadcast channels, where we all used to get our information growing up when we turned on the TV for news, cable channels aren't licensed and regulated by the FCC and they're they're going to they're largely free from from that kind of uh, interference. The new test case will be these lawsuits you might heard about have heard about from Dominion Voting Systems and Smartmatic. who are going after Trump lawyers and Trump allies like my pillow guy Mike Lindell to the tune of one point three billion dollars because they say that he basically defamed their company through the big lie over and over again with accusations about voting machines changing votes. And so this is a huge chess case for this moment and the challenge of mitigating the spread of false information. We don't know how this case is going to turn out, but it will be very consequential. Libel cases usually fail and plaintiffs have to prove that the information was published with knowledge that it was false. I'm not saying I have any idea where the cases will go. But it is um, it, it, people in this area who are trying to mitigate the threat of disinformation are following this and, and very interested to see where, where this is going to take us. So when you see Republicans mad that Trump and other conservatives are being deplatformed, they want to take some government action, but they certainly are outraged that Democrats are targeting conservative media to try to stop them from disseminating what they view as misinformation. So while both parties might be trying to legislate big tech, um, I don't see where they would find areas of agreement. And I think it's extremely unlikely that any of this stuff ends up becoming law. Um, so that, that's just my kind of primer on where we are about what we can do about it. And, and I'm, I'm um, happy to, to um, echo Juan's um, comments about the kind of news consumers we have to be um, later on. But but in terms of just relying on the government to solve it, um, it's it's going to fall more on us than it is going to fall on the government. Great. Th thank you so much. Um, and and Professor Whaley will follow up with you about that being the, the legal expert on our panel um, momentarily. Um, so I just kind of want to shift gears a, a bit um, and get to um, Gretchen. So the question for you um, is how has the Me Too movement specifically impacted your career and also the broader kind of context of, of journalism? Well, thank you so much, Eli. That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, so for, for all of you, you were probably still maybe in middle school when my story happened uh, for the kids who are watching. But on July 6th, 2016, I made the biggest decision of my life and uh, decided to jump off a cliff all by myself and um, sued my boss at the time, Roger Ailes at Fox News for sexual harassment. And, you know, that was a really, really scary move um, for me as a journalist because in journalism, you're never supposed to be the story. And I didn't want to be the story, but I knew that it was going to set off 
um, a huge tidal wave of, um, you know, media attention. And really, I had no idea what was going to happen to me the next minute, to be quite honest, um, or the next day or the next week. But um, amazingly, it, it led to what I like to call this cultural revolution that we're living in right now. Um, if you put it in perspective, my story was a full 15 months before the Me Too movement and the Harvey Weinstein allegations. And um, I'm proud for whatever role I played in, in instigating that. But what I really think helped spur on the, the movement was actually the media. And I can say this because I've been in journalism for 30 years, before my story, for the most part, we didn't care about sexual harassment stories. We didn't pitch them in morning meetings. Um, I think we maybe wanted to, but we knew that they probably wouldn't get the coverage that they deserved. And so in a way, the media helped put these stories in or on the back burner. Um, also, a lot of silencing mechanisms inside corporate America have helped to put these stories on the back burner, which is what I'm fighting for now on Capitol Hill with the bill that I have to eradicate these, these silencing mechanisms, which will be a game changer when it does pass. Um, but in the meantime, the media didn't, didn't really pay attention to these stories. And, and after my case, um, they started paying attention. And a big element of that was social media because as much as I hate it for my teenage kids, it helped this movement dramatically because people could come forward and either put their name and face on their story or they could come forward anonymously and say, me too. And it helped the story exponentially to stay alive. Um, and then the media itself started covering these stories and they started covering them first about journalists and then they started covering them about Hollywood actresses. And then to, to make me feel so much better about this because I was hearing from women from all over the world from every socioeconomic background and every profession. And I knew that this was a pervasive epidemic far more reaching uh, in tentacles than just Hollywood and, and journalism. And they started covering stories about the every, the every woman. And that's when it really started to change. And we started doing stories about police officers and firefighters and teachers and airplane mechanics and fast food workers. And I think we started to educate America about this incredibly serious problem that we have to confront. I did a documentary about the every woman story because I specifically wanted to show that it wasn't just famous people who were having this happen to them. And so, you know, I thank the media for covering these stories because when women still reach out to me by the thousands, um, and I can't get to all of them, but, but as I try to answer a lot of them and respond, I say, go to the media. You know, it's such a personal decision with what you're gonna do about your story, but if there was ever a time for the media to listen to you and care about your story, it's now. And in fact, just now, while I was waiting to talk, um, I had three women on Instagram asking me, you know, what should I do about my story? So. Um, the third thing that I would just add to that is that, so you have sort of this perfect storm of the media caring about the stories, social media exploding this movement. And then you had all of you, you had the American public. You had the American public who started hearing these stories and they were pissed off because they were like, wait, we haven't solved these issues yet. And the reason that they felt that way because they weren't hearing about these stories because companies have figured out how to make them all secret. And so when they started realizing that this generation of people was still combating this, and they started thinking about their own children and kids your age, they became really upset and angry. And so they paid attention to the stories that the media was doing, which continues to fuel the whole cycle of then the media continues to do those stories, right? Because the media does stories that people pay attention to. So I would just say that there have been, um, you know, we, the media has played a dramatic role in, in keeping this movement alive. And, um, and I would just also add that um, there are a lot of parallels between the Me Too movement and, and the BLM movement. They're incredibly different, but there are some very stark similarities. And that would be that um, in this day and age, we have the ability to have evidence and we have the ability to show people evidence. 
And when you see George Floyd being killed, you see that, that's evidence. We didn't always have that. And in the Me Too movement, you have people who have evidence on their phones. And that has been a game changer as far as I, I believe, um, keeping the stories, bringing the stories to life. And for the first time, really showing the American public um, how serious um, these issues are. And it's the reason I believe that they're not going away this time. Gretchen, I was wondering if I could follow up on that, um, just based on one of the questions we had, Ayla and I got in the chat. And that has to do with this, this concept of anonymity, right? So you mentioned that there's an element of it that is beneficial because people can tell their stories in a way uh, that maybe they wouldn't feel comfortable coming forward in the old days, right? Where it was really a public, some kind of public statement. Um, but on the other hand, the question is, well, there's a lack of accountability that comes with anonymity that's comes through the chat. And I feel like our kids understand this better than we did, where there's bullying that happens online. There's, there's something about you can say things that you couldn't say face to face and you wouldn't say face to face. And I wonder if you could, particularly given all your years in journalism, if you could speak to that um, and how that's affected you. Do you think journalism and how, are, are kids who don't know anything other than online sort of anonymity can manage to, to sort of thread that needle between the benefits of it, this is great because they can speak in a way that maybe they couldn't, and the downsides where they've suffered, I think, in ways that maybe we didn't. Yeah, thanks so much for the question. I'll just echo what Dana said earlier, that um, if you pay attention to all the trolls out there, you'd shoot yourself every night. I mean, you know, listen, uh, the number one thing that my lawyer said to me before I uh, made my case public was they're going to kill you. They're, they're going to malign you. They're going to come up with every single thing that's not true about you, and they're, they're going to try to kill you. Um, and that was true. That was true, as did a lot of my former colleagues who were my friends in the media. Um, so I guess my, my advice on just personally how you handle those things is that you can't, you can't pay attention to the people, no offense, Dana, but sitting in their basement, um, <laughs> just sitting on Twitter all night and writing uh, horrible, horrible comments. I couldn't agree more. What? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really hard to, to, to not, but, but I, I have um, become very liberated by not looking at, at um, all of the comments. And on occasion, I will write back to them because I did grow up with my parents telling me that you should kill them with kindness. Um, and on occasion, I'll, I'll, I'll write back something like, wow, you must have woken up on the wrong side of the bed. And, um, and then it's amazing how they fall all over themselves and be like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't really mean it that way. And I was, you know. But um, I, I think that, that from an accountability point of view, I'm not, saying that, um, I'm not saying that perpetrators should be allowed to not be accountable in the media. I think one of the massive changes that we've seen um, with the press covering these stories is that perpetrators are being forced to come out and apologize now right away. Well, first of all, women are being believed. I never thought I'd see that. Um, and then perpetrators are, be, are being held accountable uh, by the media and, and they're facing the consequences. And a lot of that is driven by the media. Um, so from an accountability point of view, um, I think we're finally seeing the right people getting their just due. Well, and you make a really, I think, excellent point about, I mean, from a lawyer standpoint as well, about the fact that things are on our phones, right? I mean, I think this is how Representative Raskin, they pulled off the impeachment trial in a matter of days because everything uh, was memorialized. And as I tell my students, I mean, videos don't lie. They don't misremember. They don't die. I mean, they're there for good. And uh, you can believe them or not, but it's a lot, it's a lot harder uh, to just completely uh, set them aside. Um, I wanted to follow up with Juan, though, uh, because you know, we you talk about me too, and you know, as a mother of four daughters, I just want to say it's really admirable and amazing, and, and the, paving the way that uh, these women and uh, all the women in this in this room have been done, but you in particular. But Juan, we've also seen you mentioned um, that you. I, I thought it was fascinating, kind of what AB was saying that that you paid attention to how power operates, which I think is also what Gretchen's talking about, um, uh, which it hasn't been amenable to uh, women for many years. And that, um, that one of the things you noticed was that sort of law enforcement or people in power view certain people as suspect, others not 
perhaps based on the color of their skin. I'm, I'm adding words there. But I'm wondering, how do you think the media has handled the Black Lives Matter movement? And do you think, similar to what Gretchen's indicated, that things are, are shifting uh, for people around race by virtue of more accountability through these various uh, digital platforms that we have and, and the technology that Dana mentioned? Uh, Kim, I think that uh, Dana and Gretchen are hitting it on the head. I mean, to me, if I stood up and said to the general public, I saw a police officer kneel on a black man's neck for nine minutes, they would say, you know, you're black, he's black. Uh, you know, we don't know if that's exactly what happened. The benefit of the doubt would always redound to the police because... I think just the, the public authority we grant to police is accompanied by sort of a trust in their ability to exercise power. We give them that power because we see them as our protectors in a very general sense. I'm talking about the general public, not necessarily in, in the minority community, although it's generally true there. I think people might be surprised. People want that kind of protection from police. But when you see police behave in an abusive manner, again, you know, you think back to something like Rodney King and how they moved the trial from LA out to Simi Valley, you know, to mostly white community, and then the officers are cleared because they believe the officers, in that case, e despite, despite uh, audiovisual evidence. But now, uh, you don't have to be just, you know, lucky to have a camera there because of cell phones and the like. Uh, and I thought this was a, quite an insight by Gretchen. I mean, I, I think that is exactly why Black Lives Matter took off in the way that it did last year, is because you have the video coverage, not only of George Floyd, but you have other incidents around the country now where you can have visual em uh, evidence. And I think this is amplified by the police supposedly having body cameras. So what it does is it's, you know, the, it, it's not that these videos are beyond uh, contradiction. Obviously, the lens is limited in what you see. You're not seeing my whole house. You're seeing me st sitting in front of my uh, desktop computer. So other things may be happening outside the frame, and we have to learn about that too. But the fact that not just the jury, but the newspaper or the TV station can carry a video that shows what happened, not based on my testimony or the police officer, but to some degree impartial testimony of the moment is just so powerful because as I say, it's never the case that the people in power were gonna believe Gretchen <laughs> as a woman or gonna believe me as a black man. Yeah, well, and, that, and verifying facts, I think, fundamental, foundational, uh, something every student should focus on. It's not opinion, it's about fact. Um, really helpful insights. I'm, I'm gonna turn it back to Eli to shift topics for our guest, Rick Burke. Thank you. Yeah, so sort of in the same vein about, about facts, um, something, and, and sort of backtracking about, uh, sort of talking about misinformation again, and, and Rick, uh, you and Professor Whaley and I had talked about this a bit when we spoke a few days before, but I, I, I want to get your perspective on what's, what's the media's role in the sort of disinformation economy that we live in, and, and, and what can you say about your experience specifically, especially with regards to the pandemic? Um, you know, what has Stat done? What have you done? And, and, and what do you think the role of journalists is, is to combat this internally? Thanks. Thanks, Eli. First, first of all, I want to thank you all for having me because, um, as you know, I I went to Whitman, so it's like <laughs> the Tatler and the Black and White. I was editor of the Black and White. We we're total rivals. But um, but I, if I may, for a second, also say how important. Um, how first of all, how impressed I am about what you all, the, the groups you've gathered and the discussions you've had these past few days. It's so important. Um, for society, for the public, for the future of journalism. And, um, and I just want to tell you for a second about how vital I think high school journalism is, if I may. Um, and 
It, and I speak with experience because my biggest success in my decades long career was in high school. Um, when, uh, when I broke a story with another colleague about how Vice President Nixon had been exposed to microwave radiation when he was vice president in 1958. That story came out um, when we were seniors at Whitman and it ricocheted literally around the world, the young Woodward and Bernstein. Um, and it was a really fun experience and it showed that you can be in high school and your journalism can make a difference. I put the story on page three and not page one of the black and white because I thought the most important thing is local news and what we're doing in the school and not what happened 30 years before. But I wanna tell you, if you jump from that 10 years after that, from my being a senior at Whitman, 10 years later, I was a, a, a lowly new reporter at the New York Times and the Washington Bureau. And I was sitting around during lunch and I was the only guy around, only person around. And the national security correspondent turned to me because I was the only one there and said, you won't believe it. I got this, this classified document that Nixon was exposed to radiation during the kitchen debates. And I said, Michael, I broke that in high school. <laughs> and he said, you're just, you did not. I said, check the clips. I broke that in high school. And if, and, um, and it's been downhill for me since, but, um, but let me just say that uh, the fundamentals I learned in high school at the, pay, at the black and white um, were, were lessons I've carried with me throughout my career. What, what I've done in the subsequ subsequent years as a journalist are no different from what I did in high school. I've just built and built and built on that experience and I get paid more money because I didn't get paid and we don't get paid in, in high school. But I just wanted to tell, tell you that because, um, because of the, the importance I think of, of what you all are doing and our advisor at the time in, at Whitman, her um, name was um, Dr. Regis L. Boyle. And she would say to us relentlessly, accuracy and reliability, accuracy and reliability. And that was drummed into me uh, throughout my career. And I think it has relevance for this discussion because as we move forward and your question about um, how we cover the news accuracy and where we go from here, um, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle in terms of what's happened with people going, um, uh, uh, hyper-partisan uh, news outlets, people spouting off things on, on TV and online and on social media that just are not true. And I think what will save society and save us all is journalists who will uh, stick to, as you all were saying before, stick to the facts and show that they, they are delivering authoritative information and um and and i and i also think for those of you whether you go into journalism or not i just think the experience you have right now in high school thinking these issues through and honing your writing skills and your 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 uh, pursuing your when you're curious about a subject getting to the bottom of it instead of trusting people that you don't know, I think is, is really important. And to your, to your question specifically about STAT and what we've done in the pandemic, for those of you not familiar with STAT, we're an online uh, health and, and science publication, um, a little over five years old. And um, we, um, we covered the pandemic very early. We were I think the first, made the first reporter in this country to to warn about what was happening in in China, and it was sort of a relentless story for us last year. And what happened, uh, and the reason we were we were able to cover it, even being a very a small, relatively small news organization, is we had reporters who had spent years developing sources and relationships with credible sources in epidemiology, public health, drug and vaccine development. These are complicated areas. 
And you can't just throw a reporter on these subjects very easily. And I think the reason why some of our journalism broke through is people were thirsting for credible information. So last, um, last March, our, our traffic went from 1.5 million uniques in, in uh, a month to, 20, to more than 23 million. And I think it's because obviously people are concerned about the pandemic, but I think there's a thirst out there for authoritative, credible information. And I think all that we can do as journalists, whether we're in high school or whether we're out of high school, is to, um, to produce credible information from credible sources and learn where to go for your information and who to trust. So the million dollar question is where you go, right? <laughs> I think, um, I, thanks for that. That's super interesting. And, uh, and I think it kind of segues into my next question actually for Dana, um, which is if you could, and many people here probably understand this being on the Tatler, but could you explain, Dana, the difference between opinion journalism <laughs> and investigative journalism? Oh. Um, and or whatever, however she wanted to define it, what's the, what Rick just described, right? And how those two things differ. And, you know, one of the people in the chat said, well, it feels like there's good journalists and bad journalists. And, you know, CNN gets pigeonholed as preaching to their choir, Fox is preaching to, to their choir. And so no one's neutral. No one is objective. Uh, this is a pie in the sky. So I'm wondering, first, if you can just define those two terms for, for us. And so people can have that clear in their head when they're reading or watching something that an opinion's different from a more fact-based journal, uh, journalistic approach. And secondly, um, what do we do about this perception that all of all journalists are biased? Okay, well, let me give you the traditional um, answer to that question about investigative reporting, uh, like you know Rick so famously does, and um, you know so many uh, amazing journalists do. And investigative reporting is just, you know, inher it's inherent in the name you investigate and you look into something that uh, is not right in front of your face. You, it takes time, it takes research, it takes sources, it takes sources upon sources. It takes getting people to tell you things who are not supposed to tell you things. Um, you know, like uh, Richard Nixon is exposed to something you should be exposed to. I mean, that's, you know, investigative journalism. Watergate is obviously the most famous. Uh, but it, investigative journalism happens every single day, and it's really the it's the the art and the skill of exposing something that is either untoward, unethical, illegal, um, and it is in it for the most part it is it flies in the face of what is supposed to be the public good, right? And and it takes a lot of time to do that traditionally if. You, if one is a, a good in, investigative journalist, and these days it also, you know, takes a team of people and money, right? I mean, it's and, fun, and yeah, money, and money, yeah. and money. But um, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, and a lot of it. Certainly at CNN, we have an investigative team, and I, I definitely think that's the case for a lot of other news outlets. Opinion is in an opinion column. For example, um, like Juan, are you comfortable with me saying that that was what you, that's what you write? Yes. All right. right. Okay. <laughs> so you have a, uh, the best opinion columns like his, uh, like when Juan, when you were at, um, at CNN way back in the day, I won't tell anybody else <laughs> who's not on this call that that was the case. I was a producer back then. Um, and then on the other side of the, of the political spectrum, you had, Robert Novak, Roland Evans, people who made their um, names as, as reporters, but they had reported opinion pieces or they'd report, reported columns. But for the most part, it is, you have a point of view and you have a point of view and, and you, um, you write about that point of view and you back up that point of view. The, the best opinion columns, I think, are also reported. Um, you back up that point of view with uh, with information based on sources you talk to, and that was what 
you guys can all Google Robert Novak and Roland Evans, but that's what they did so well. And, you know, definitely won one also. And, um, and there's no, there's no secret about it. You know what you're getting, you know what you're consuming, you know that uh, you're not getting just the facts, ma'am. Whereas uh, with investigative reporting, you're supposed to just get the facts, ma'am. And not just that, it's a big bonus. It's facts that you haven't seen before and that, and that people in power don't want you to see. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so that's the big difference. So let's go to, let's sort of talk about the reality of the world that we're living in now that you mentioned, Kim, which is that uh, you still have all of those things, but for sure, reporting and um, a point of view, which is different from straight out opinion, they're, they're blurry now. They definitely are. I mean, what I try to do, I'll just you know, speak for myself. What I try to do is be biased towards facts and truth. And um, the past you know, five years has been the most challenging and so many instances, the most uncomfortable based on how I was trained and based on where my comfort zone is as a reporter, having to, because my responsibility is truth and calling out things that politicians say that are not true um, and having to be on television time and time again, coming out of a live presidential event where the now former president said things were, that were just flat wrong, just absolute lies. And it took us a long time to get to using the L word. But finally, I mean, you could see, you, you could almost see and feel the, the tension as we were sort of pushing towards using that word as, as journalists. And it was, and it was really hard and it still is, frankly, it still is. Um, but it's not like, let me give an example. It's not like, um, let's say there's a, there's, there's a columnist who is uh, very much a free market column, a, a, you know, person who believes that taxes should be, or, or let's just, uh, taxes should be lower and that government should uh, get the hell out of people's lives. That is, you, you can kind of see that as an opinion. It's an opinion about a philosophy, about an ideology. And if done well, it's explained um, properly. That's a different question than, Is, is what uh, a politician saying true or not? And we have such a responsibility now as journalists to get to the latter. And um, I, I, you know, it's, it's much better right now <laughs> than it was before because as for me personally, as a journalist, I feel like I'm much more able to, um, you know, cover, policy and issues and, and issue differences. And we're getting there. We're getting away from uh, the singular focus on the cult of personality and the, you know, divisive politics. It's, and the divisions are more traditional divisions. Do conservative Democrats really want to sign on to a $15 minimum wage bill? I mean, I, I will cover that happily any day of the, of the week because that's like, you know, those are real things that really should be debated. Um, even within parties. So, um, well, if I could follow up, just a quick question yeah. for CNN in particular. So, you know, um, there's print. I mean, there's print, right? As you indicated, there's stories. Rick's Rick's done this in his career. But what about the CNN type, Fox News type panels? MSNBC. I mean, AB and I've been on them with you, and yeah, yeah. Where it's you're you're an investigative journalist, but then sometimes you're on the panel to give analysis. Yeah. So. And this is one of the questions from the from the chat. What's the difference between analysis and news or facts? And how does a consumer sort of hold those two concepts and discriminate that the opinion or the analysis is not the fact? Yeah. So I mean, you know, that that still happens. I think the way I don't know if anybody can kind of take this jump who's in high school, but you know, what it, it used to be when you look at the newspaper, look at the New York Times, it's the reported story and the next to it is it says news analysis. 
So it's not opinion, it's not a column, it's news analysis, which is, which is different from the straight, you know, just the facts, ma'am. And it's different from here's my opinion based on my ideology. It's what does this mean? It's trying to put it into context that maybe that's the best way to explain it. Trying to put it into context. What does this mean? Um, you know, whatever happened today, what, why does it matter? And, you know, depending on where you are on a, on a panel, you, Kim, you would say, I would ask you, why does this matter? And you would give me an answer based on your experience and your knowledge of the law. You know, I would ask AB, why does this matter? And she would give me an answer based on her reporting, talking to sources and her experience covering uh, journalism for, you know, a few years, uh, covering and covering Washington for a few years. And um, so that, that, is, that is the difference. When you, when you hear somebody just saying, you know, I try not to use the words I think on television. I'm not always successful, but I try not to use the words I think, because nobody should really care what I think. It's what I'm hearing. It's what, um, uh, what I'm seeing, what I'm observing. Um, but what I think for me personally shouldn't, shouldn't matter. I'm not saying I haven't messed up, but I really try not to. Look, if I could jump in for one second, one, I, I want to just jump off something Dana said earl, earlier about how this has become uh, blurry uh, in, in a way that it didn't used to be. And I, I totally agree with everything she said. Um, but in addition, it's not as clear cut as it used to be. And I, and I would take what you said about the New York Times. It is absolutely true. We would have news and then news analysis. Um, if you look at the New York Times now and did an accounting, it's almost you almost never see a news analysis in the New York Times anymore. They're, they're, they, they may be there once in a while, but we used to do them, you know, every day you'd see a news analysis. The reason is, is because now the expectation is because of the news cycle and how fast things move and the premium on uh, giving some perspective and context, the 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 editors encourage the analysis to be in the news piece. They don't want it to veer into opinion, but it's a fine line between being authoritative and being opinionated. And so I will tell if, if a reporter comes to me and has a story this is very straightforward, I'll say, you know, that sounds like a story anyone could write. You need to bring your authority and your knowledge to the story. Um, and, and in the old days, some of that would have been called opinion, but now it's much more, we're much more apt to push context and um, perspective and even point of view. The question, the, the danger is, you know, how far do you go and when does that veer into opinion? But it's much more muddy than it ever was. Yeah, I mean, that's, Gretchen, you're nodding. Did you want to add to that? I mean, I worked at Fox News. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I understand this maybe, maybe well, Juan does too. Um, you know, in the, in the olden days when I started, you had to get two sources, the way Dan, Dana was describing um, with no email. And there were tons of stories that I wanted to report that I couldn't. I didn't have, I knew the stories were true, but I didn't have the sources and I didn't report them. That's, I think that's really dramatically changed. Um, to a certain extent in the digital world. Um, and then I would just say that, that when opinion television started, maybe 20 years ago, it was a brilliant invention. Because at the time, it was just starting to be where you could get your news while you were at work. And so when you came home, you'd already heard the headlines for the most part. And so you wanted to hear analysis and you wanted to hear opinion. Even if you didn't necessarily agree with it, you had already heard the headlines. So you thought, well, I wonder what people think about the news. And so in its inception, it was, it was brilliant. Um, now we've been led down this rabbit hole of just complete polarization. And I would argue that people only want, they only watch what they want to hear. And therefore they're just continuing in their own silos of information instead of venturing out to hear what, what other people are thinking about the exact same story. 
Um, and that is to the detriment of our nation as far as trying to come together on anything. And we see it play out in Washington as well. It's just sort of, it's everywhere now. Um, and I would just also add that I believe that, that Fox News is a different entity now than it was even when I was there four and a half years ago. I mean, it's completely changed uh, in the sense of um, not even having as many opinions, forgive me one, but um, from your point of view, I mean, I just think it's a completely different entity and I really don't watch it that much, um, but I think it's completely changed even from the time when, when I was there. And that's, and, you know, that's to a detriment to, um, to the nation that we've become so polarized that a lot of people will say to me, where can I just go to hear the facts? And I think people are, are really confused about where they can just um, find the facts. Yeah, though, I think that that's kind of like the bottom line in a lot of ways. But I wanted, uh, and I, I know there's a, a number of follow-ups. This is really getting a lot of interest in the chat. But I wanted to ask AB actually, um, following up on what on Dana's point about this covering this last administration and how difficult um, it was in a different way, and how the press moved from um, from not using the L word to using the L word. Um, somebody raised a question in the chat about what the fairness doctrine, uh, uh, that's, was a regulatory requirement years ago that people had to give both sides. And I think it's gotten harder to give both sides when the other side is false. It's flatly false. It, there's, there's no, there's no opinion about, uh, something that's flatly, uh, uh, you know, false. Um, so, so. You, you mentioned a few things. I just want to tick through a number of legal issues, too, because people have asked while I have the floor for a second. One is just so everyone understands, the First Amendment, and, and I'm sure that the reporters here will disagree with me to some degree, is limited. The First Amendment is not unlimited. Um, there are regulations on speech. Uh, there's regulations on speech on the, on the te regular television, on the cable, on, on cable news, on the radio. Um, and when it comes to, as AB indicated, when it comes to what we get in our in our phones, and we have this sense that when we click on on the internet, it's free, but it's actually not. Your data is being gathered and used as a commodity. It's it's you know these internet companies have gotten richer than any other co any company in the history of humankind, and that's something that government could figure out how to regulate. Imagine if every one of your clicks or your tweets or your TikToks actually had to be paid for in order to be shared and sold versus the other way around. Um, but my question for, for AB is, you know, what is the relationship now between politics and politicians and the press? Because if I understand stood Dana correctly, there was, a, and, and Rick can speak to this I know as well, there was a time where politicians pretty much said accurate things and if they didn't, they got hammered and we moved on to something else or they they resigned or there was you know there was some kind of political pushback can you talk a little bit about how, how where we are right now as a political a reporter and journalist well i think dana has done a great job um, in this transition in the last few years of trying to provide perspective and context to actually trying to defend the system which cannot function unless people are telling the truth so I think a lot of us in the last few years have really seen ourselves as trying to explain to people what checks and balances are when you undermine the judiciary, when you politicize the military, and when you lie compulsively, you can't effectively govern. And so journalists have found themselves in this awful corner trying to call out lies. And because... Um, because for many of Trump's voters that never mattered, you see a lot of lies right now about the election and January 6th from Republicans who believe they won't pay a political price with those voters, and they're going to continue to talk about that kind of stuff at CPAC over the weekend and in their um, fundraising texts and emails because their voters believe that Trump, that the election was rigged and he won it, and on and on and on. So there is an embrace of lying that has not ended with Trump. And we're in a very um, tricky place. I mean, it's very hard to 
um, to deal with people who are um, aware of reality, but are continuing to let their constituents live in an alternate reality and not tell them you have been lied to. So Mitt Romney, Adam Kinzinger, and Mitch McConnell, and Liz Cheney. I mean, I can name, there are fewer than 20 people in the Republican ranks of the House and the Senate who are now telling their voters, you have been lied to. And we can't move on in our government and solve problems and work across the aisle until we accept this. We can't have the next election tainted by these lies. And, and, and so it's a, it's a huge um, problem and a pressure on journalists that if you call out lies, you have Trump derangement syndrome. This is what, you know, what they said two years ago. Now we're at the point where, you know, we thought that people, I mean, like, like uh, Dana describes, you had to get to the point where you didn't say falsehoods, um, a misstatement that sounded like it was actually wrong. You have to actually say that was a lie. And it's cost me professionally and it's cost me financially, but I've continued to pound away at this because I think journalists have to be pro-system. And the system depends on describing to the viewer that that is a violation of checks and balances from a co-equal branch of government, that the Congress has the power of the purse, that that is not true, that the executive can steal emergency funding that was already congressionally appropriated, and that they can relinquish the power of impeachment. And all these truths that are either disappearing because of political polarization or because we have a civics education crisis at the, time, at the country as well. But lies, there are there is only one truth. There are not 12. And while opinions can abound, we have to return to the embrace of facts. And that's part of what people need to look for if we get to a discussion about how they're going to find facts, fact-based news um, and become a discerning news consumer so that they can tell the difference. It, it's true what, what Dana mentioned that I as a I, uh, I write columns that are factual, so I line up an argument, but I'm a columnist. Dan and I were reporters together years ago. I am no longer a reporter. I'm a political analyst, and I write commentary, and I get these unbelievably angry emails on a, every time I file, and then I send them a, a note back, and I say, thank you for writing. You might have noticed that my column, which is not an article, was labeled commentary. And often they do apologize because they didn't know the difference. And so this problem that we have with media literacy, let alone the fact that people don't know where to find good facts, is, is really something that um, the next generation has to take on as a serious challenge and to understand that it affects our discourse in government and the debates. It depends. It, it affects how informed people are. Um, and it's, it's really essential that people who are well-educated at BCC and, and, and beyond as they grow up, know that they can be an agent for change and progress through media literacy and through learning about. Um, it's their civic duty to find good information and know what's going on in, with their government so that we can hold the government accountable because people who are hoovering conspiracy theories online cannot help us make progress hold the government accountable and problem solve. It's only the well-informed. And so that, that's really what I want to drive home with people who are in high school and are in journalism. Um, even if you don't go into journalism, it's really your responsibility of a citizen to, to check in on, on, on the news and the debate and, and what your government is doing and find a path where you can learn the right facts. Um, you know, I know that Eli has a number of terrific questions from the chat, but um, when you started explaining, well, you know, th this is a big lie and there's only a certain pe number of people in the Republican Party that are telling the truth and, and you know, this and you've, you've had pushback. In my mind, what I was hearing was, OK, she's a Democrat completely ignore her like that's and I, I say this. I wrote you, you know what? You just have to ask Mitt Romney and all the Republicans who have said this whether or not 
there was a global conspiracy involving Bill Barr and dead Venezuelans and every single member of the media and every single Democrat and Brad Ravensburger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, and Doug Ducey in Arizona and all the state Republican officials who certified the elections in the swing states for Biden, it, who then by the conspiracy, by the fiction, would have elected a whole bunch of Republicans to the Senate and the House, but then somehow rigged it against Donald Trump. This is not a democratic theory. This is this is what Mitch McConnell is telling the voters. It's what Liz Cheney is telling the voters. It's what Adam Kinzinger and Mitt Romney are telling the voters. They, they just are drowned out by people who don't want to tell the voters that because they don't want to fall out of favor with Donald Trump. So, so my question, I mean, I, I, this, you know, I'm not a reporter or media person, just started a few years ago, but when I wrote this book on the Constitution and I was disinvited to speak at my high school graduation in a small girls school in Buffalo because the constitution was too political. Then I realized we're in big trouble. <laughs> so my, my question, it was I end unceremoniously on a disinvited because um, the parents said, I will not let my child graduate if Kim Whaley is the actual commencement speaker um, because she's so political with her constitution talk. So I want to throw out um, to everyone following up on AP's question. And I know as again, I'm, I'm sorry to put uh, Eli on hold here, but I want to get everybody's input in this. Is it is this cat out of the bag? Is it too late? Is it are we ever going to be able to get back to not just even journalism, but fact based thinking and conversation and curiosity? I mean, or is are we just swimming upstream and it's and because of the technology, frankly, and the unregulated world of the Internet, it's just it's just that the, you know we're never going to get back there. A any thoughts from our all of our panelists? Jump on in. I, oh, I, go I, ahead, Rick. As I mentioned before, I I think the genie's out of the bottle. I don't think we're going to ever go go back to where we we were. There are a few there, there's a, a few bright spots in that. I think uh, journalists are more aggressive in calling out facts, lies, and factual errors than they ever were in the past. Even before the, you know, fake news and all this, you know, I, I think we might have been a little too complacent in questioning politicians and and the official take on things. I mean, now when you see fact checks on TV and in the newspaper and online, uh, um, those um, th those didn't exist, you know, years ago when we started out. Maybe once in a while there'd be a speech and there'd be a little story with someone checking one of the facts in the speech. But but by and large, politicians got away with a lot. They didn't necessarily weren't the sort of bald liars that they can be that we've seen more recently. But but I do think uh, journalists are more aggressive and I think that's a good thing. And I think all we can do is encourage authoritative uh, reported journalism and encourage consumers of news to, to, to be curious themselves and do research on their own and look out for uh, credible outlets that they can get information from. And the other thing I think we need to do as journalists is also just be more open to um, I mean, we've had some blind blind spots over the years. Look at, you know, um, uh, um, most media organizations had no, were shocked that Trump got elected. And that, um, that shouldn't have been the case. And there should have been deeper reporting out in the country. Um, I remember back years ago when I was an editor at The Times, I had a, a, a desk and a TV on and I usually had it on to Fox News. And the reason is, um, is because I thought it was important to hear all points of view. And I remember one of the big bosses came up to me and ridiculed me and said, why are you listening to, uh, why are you watching Fox News? Why do you have Fox? And I said, we need to hear all points of view. And he just kind of, ridiculed me for doing that. And I, I'd i like to think and hope that that wouldn't happen again, but I'm, I'm not so sure. So thank you very much for sharing that. I'm curious, Juan, to hear what your perspective is on if there's sort of a parallel of that at Fox 
Um, and yeah, just, just what you think about that. Well, you know, some things jump out at me, Eli. One of the things I've noticed is how infrequently you will get an investigative story broken by conservative media. And the reason I mention this is we've been hearing conversations about the difference between investigative journalism, opinion journalism, news analysis, all very well articulated. But, you know, to me, the reason that Trump had such success with calling reporters enemy of the people and our product fake um, is because he was engendering in the public this idea that, you know, mainstream press and their investigative work and their focus on what they take to be the facts is not reflective of my reality or the reality I share with you. So stop here and think a second. The investigative journalism in my lifetime that really stands out, you know, are things, are, is, is journalism that dug into things like Watergate, for example, or dug into child sex abuse by the church, by the authorities, or more recently, you know, Gretchen was mentioning Black Lives Matter, dug into exactly what are the numbers, what are the statistics on who gets shot and who is killed by police, you know, and, and why is it that we don't have a database for that kind of information? Um, and then from the perspective of the right, oh, it, these are attacks on authority. These are attacks on the establishment. This is an attack on the America that I know by people who they label, and I think Trump successfully labeled, as people who don't love America and don't like this country, and they're trying to undermine the country somehow rather than uh, reflect, you know, A.B. Stoddard's, you know, outstanding ethic in terms of she's willing to take a financial hit. She's willing to be, you know, pushed off of some networks because she's not mouthing what they, what the executives or anybody wants to hear for that audience. She's willing to just speak her truth. And it, she's willing to do the reporting, the investigation, et cetera, um, but I got to tell you that even good investigative reporting can be rejected by an audience that's told that the press is out to undermine the America you love, uh, that, you know, the press is your enemy. It's incredible to me because, I, you know, you know like all of you at uh, Bethesda Chevy Chase, I've loved journalism since I was a high school student. And I see it as a way to understand how power works, as I said to you at the very beginning. And I wanna know how power works because I want that power to operate to you know, the benefit of my community. And here I mean my neighborhood, my family, uh, you know, my children, grandchildren, all the rest. Um, so to me, it's, it's like a different view of news opinion, news analysis. It's that, you know, they, it's like a, a, a conservative, news outlet these days, I don't think they value investigative work so much as they want to um, affirm pre-existing uh, worldview, which is to say, you know, this is the way I view things as a patriot and I like America. And, you know, to me, it's baffling because I think that lies are just a basic corrosive when it comes to a healthy, successful American civic life. But you, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Rush Limbaugh, for example, who the recently deceased radio talk show host, he's not an investigative reporter, but I think he made his mark by mocking the press uh, belittling the idea that the New York Times, Washington Post, you know, and, you know, people who spend money doing major investigative work, much less just sending someone to cover the school board, um, that that's a waste of time and a worse waste of resources. They invest instead on undercutting that kind of reportage and affirming that pre-existing uh, perspective that they deem or call conservative. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much. And I think that that's something that, that I've certainly just read a lot about 
um, in the press, like I think notably with Fox, Shep Smith um, switching to CNBC for what what he described was sort of this this overload of opinion reporting um, and not enough focus on just the straight news. So I'm curious, Gretchen, um, to hear what you have to say say about this having having worked at Fox. Um, uh, do, do you perceive this as an argument to not watch or not support Fox? And, and, and where do you think society should go from here? Yeah, so unfortunately, because of my stringent NDAs, I can't give all the opinions that I would like to give as somebody who was there um, 11 years, other than to say that I think that we're at a crossroads in our nation because <clears throat> we've seen over the last four years that even when you present evidence in video form, uh, that people still don't believe it. And what we saw happen after the election is that we saw um, Fox call um, Arizona for Biden. And then that set off this huge firestorm amongst Fox viewers. How dare you do that? How dare you call something factual as, as it is? And so then we saw a huge rating surge for these before then little known other conservative outlets called OAN and Newsmax. And suddenly you had Newsmax at 7 p.m. Eastern beating Fox News. I mean, who would have ever thought that? But it was because people were following the conspiracy theory to another outlet. Um, so back to the thoughts of what Rick was saying and how do you put the genie back in the bottle? When you can't, um, when, you, when, the, when the truth even on videotape doesn't resonate with a huge swath of society, um, I don't have great hope with bringing people back together with, with just the facts. Um, I will say that, that maybe um, now when we return to, and this is not political at all, but just if we return to somewhat more normal presidency, um, as Dana was saying, and just sort of covering like taxes and um, immigration and things like that, and there'll be varying opinions on both sides of that, that maybe we will be able to return to a little bit more normalcy where people start believing the news again, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that we will just continue to have more fractured entities that continue to feed uh, disinformation. Yeah, so um, yeah, thank you. Thank you also for sharing, for sharing your perspective on that. Um, really quickly, uh, back to Dana, we have a, we have a question in the chat. Um, do you think that society should be calling out um, uh, media that that skews leftward equally, um, and 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 what do you think should be the role uh, of society, sort of in checking in in in, in checking that? Yeah. If media that skew left um, are very transparent about who they are and what they are saying, a and b, um, don't tell flat out lies and whip up their viewers into a frenzy about lies and as Juan said you know enemy of the people uh and and you know doing so in a very if, if they if they act in a, in a completely irresponsible way then they should be called out of course just as right-wing media should be called out if they are simply you know, coming at the news or coming at world events from a left point of view, and we know that's what they are doing, there's nothing wrong with that. There, there really isn't. Um, you know, the hope though is that the, whatever's left of just the facts, ma'am, whether it is the, you know, the New York Times re reporting that includes the context and analysis, just like our reporting that includes the context and analysis, just as long as there is still room for that. And, um, you know, I fundamentally believe that there always, always will be. Um, so uh, we're running out of time, but we have a number of final things that, but I wanted to ask Rick and AB, I'm just looking that Politico has reported that Donald, uh, that um, Mitch McConnell has publicly stated that he's going to support Donald Trump if he's the nominee in 2024. Um, many people think he will probably be the nominee in 2024. And does that, I mean, does that affect if he is? Um, and you know, this intersection between politics 
uh, and truth that we've been talking about that I think has really shifted in the last few years. Is that a is that a concern um, for the for the future? What what are your predictions then? Um, starting with Rick and then AB, please. Well, um, one thing I um, I I can't uh, ever I know never to predict because I'm always wrong if I predict. But what I would say is the longer Trump is prominent in the news, the more that sort of drowns out everything else and dominates. And one of my big concerns in this um, last in these last few years is we reporters haven't covered government in quite the same way that we used to or that we should or the functions of government. Um, everything has been bouncing from one political story. And as a political reporter, I you know I love politics, but it's too much. It's too much. Where's the substance when we haven't, partly we haven't been able to because of all the, whether you like Trump or not, all the dramas and the, you know, you know, um, and I, I hope that we can come back to some sort of normalcy. And I think the longer Trump um, is in the limelight, and I'm not saying he should or shouldn't, but it's going to be, it's going to make it more complicated. A.B., I think I've talked about Trump enough, <laughs> so I'm actually well, going to so try to close. How about a prediction? What do, you, what do you think is going to happen? What's the trajectory going in the next few years? Well, I, I just want to close with sort of a, a way that um, that students can learn how to read the news better, because I want to like give a little helpful um, thing, a helpful note to end on. Um, there was a terrific presentation at four o'clock. Michelle Cottle from the New York Times gave on disinformation, and I really hope the students who missed it. Will listen because they'll learn a lot. This is more of an you know a quickie uh, overview, but there are ways to read stories on news aggregate sites like the News K N E W Z and the Smart News app, where if you read a story from Forbes, The Economist, The Daily Caller, Mother Jones, and then Fox News, you will end up finding out what the facts are, and you'll be able to find out what the slant is. So you'll have a handle on it. If, like my teenagers have, you feel that there's some explosive Elon Maxwell or Jeffrey Epstein news coming out and you never find it anywhere on mainstream um, news sources, it is not true. Um, there are fact check places like politifact.com and factcheck.org that you can take all your QAnon crazy theories that your friends saw on TikTok right in there and find out that Wayfair is actually not um, also joining in an international uh, sex ring and drinking the blood uh, of children along with Democrats and, and the media. These are really important ways to just try to learn to consume the news. You can, you can basically assume that everything that comes up on your Facebook wall or your Twitter or Snapchat or Instagram is BS. Just start with that premise and then search for credible sites um, so that you can learn to do this um, without worrying about what people are saying on cable news or what people are saying on these weirdo sites that your grandmother sends you that are completely partisan and look like news sites, but, but are not. So it's really important that they have a place to go where they can read the same news piece from six different perspectives and they will come away with a handle on what the information is. And it's, it's, it's also, one, I, in my, one of my first journalism classes, I remember the professor saying, what is Cosmopolitan Magazine about? And I'm dating myself and the panelists will know what Cosmo Magazine is and, and the students won't, but we all said, I don't know, like sex tips and like beauty tips and marriage tips. And he said, no, it's about anxiety. And it's designed to make you anxious. And so when you are reading a news site or you're watching a show and the anchor is just doing rage coverage and fear coverage designed to make you feel like the world's going to end, I truly believe that you should find another source or just know where that's coming from. Um, because that's those people are trying to suck you into the doom feeling for a reason. And they're probably not going to give you the best facts. Like Dana said, if you know an anchor in prime times, liberal or conservative, fine, know it, listen to their point of view, but don't 
try to search for facts on important news sites, uh, stories particularly about government and things that affect your life from someone who's just raging and trying to make you feel terrified. So those are my, my advice. That's my advice. I, I want the students particularly to come away from tonight feeling that it's not just all a totally lost cause. Well, and I agree because my daughters actually moderated Michelle um, Michelle's panel, so that's awesome. <laughs> Kim and Eli. Can I can I just uh, can I just say one thing? But I know we have to wrap up. Yeah, soon. so we were actually going to go through for final thoughts for everyone. So perfect, th perfect timing. Thanks, Dan. So should I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I want to say is that I, you know. I know that everybody has the Google machine and everybody understands how to get information about the people you're you're hearing from. But I just wanna make sure that the, that the young women who are on here understand how lucky you are that you were able to hear from Gretchen Carlson tonight directly and that she has changed the world for women. And I'm not overstating that. I, I really mean that it, from the bottom of my heart I want to say thank you as an older woman. And I want to say to all of the younger women, you have no idea how lucky you are that you got to interact with her tonight. You're here. Yeah, I, I, thank I, you I, so much. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was muted. Um, you're gonna now you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> um, we've seen a lot of journalism. We've seen a lot of journalists cry recently, which I actually think is is a whole other debate topic, but a, a very um, human human thing. And uh, I've certainly done my fair share of that over the last couple of years. But um, thank you, thank you, Dana. That was totally unexpected. Um, I would just say that um, to be a journalist, you have to be brave um, in general, and you get a lot of no's, and you get a lot of uh, doors slammed in your face and a lot of people uh, hanging up on you um, who don't wanna speak to you. And, and so maybe that's where I learned uh, my bravery to, to finally come forward um, from all the years of being rejected as I was trying to break stories along the way. Um, but I would just also encourage uh, women to, um, to speak up and to raise your hand and be in the front row um, and you know have your voice heard because that's how we continue to make change whether we're in journalism or not. So thank you for having me here tonight and thank you again, Dan. Yeah, any, th 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 thank you both for that. I, I really appreciate your, your kind of closing thoughts. Um, any, any other sort of last minute additions or thoughts from either uh, Rick or, or Juan that you'd like to add? Well, I guess I would just quickly say that, uh, come back to where I started, which is uh, that engaged, an engaged young mind with news is better than one that simply takes what the algori algorithm or the outlet feeds that mind. Um, and that you have, you have to take some responsibility. I forget who said it, but uh, somebody on our panel said tonight, that a question they often get is, you know, where can I just get the facts? Where can I find a news outlet that just tells me the facts? And uh, I think Dana just mentioned uh, that Michelle Cottle had said, you know, here, here's a site where you can see the various uh, iterations of the same story and you can come away from it uh, with a sense of what the real story is, what the facts are. And I think it, that level of engagement is required by you, that you are an involved consumer um, not simply someone who's being fed um, by a, a news media that I think is very engaged in transforming news into news and entertainment, sort of infotainment. And that is so dangerous because that's addictive and it can drive your emotions as, you know, you know, Cosmopolitan might be about anxiety, the National Enquirer is about jealousy or whatever. Um, and it can all play with your emotions, but it's not information. It does not allow you to be a better informed citizen or member of your society. Uh, and I think you have to understand people are taking advantage of you in that circumstance. And I say that even, you know, like I wrote, my last book was about Trump's war on civil rights. And before the book was out, you know, the trolls just devastated me, the book. You know, if, if you're relying on that as your basis of information, I think you're actually in a deficit. It's, it's like it's bleeding you of information uh, before the, beforehand. So uh, you have to be so aggressive about protecting yourself in this media environment. 
And Eli, if I could just uh, say, I just want to uh, say that um, I hope everyone leaves this discussion encouraged and not in despair because there's a lot of bad stuff we're talking about. But the very fact that you're having this discussion is so important um, in overcoming some of these issues we're talking about. And I, I'd like to think that there will always be an appetite um, from the public for well-reported journalism that, uh, um, that brings truth to what's going on in the world around us. And, and I, I, I feel very confident that that appetite will rather than diminish only grow. And I think uh, what's exciting for all of you in high school is that you can play a role in, in bringing us, continuing the tradition of important journalism to bring truth to power and to hold institutions and politicians accountable. And the other thing I just want to say is, for those of you involved in your school papers, I assume you're doing it, I hope you're doing it like, you, like I did, because it's fun. And I want to tell you, the fun doesn't go away. The fun for, for the, the, the fearlessness, the, the unanswered knocks on door, all that stuff, it's tough work. But, but if you have a passion for it and you're, lo you, you're looking, you're curious and you're looking for truth telling, there's nothing more fun than, than getting out in the world and telling the public what's really going on. And that fun and that satisfaction does not go away after your high school paper. It continues throughout your career if that's what you choose to do. Great, and thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and definitely working on the Tatler is a lot of fun. So if you're an underclassman at BCC, highly recommend take Tatler junior and junior year and senior year, you will not regret it. Um, I'll just turn it over to Professor Whaley really quickly um, before we wrap up. Yeah, I just want to, uh, again, thank everyone, uh, the panelists, and tell uh, students, I mean, I'm an educator as well, the fact that these people came tonight for an hour and a half just shows not just their dedication to the craft, um, but their integrity as human beings. Um, and and I, I didn't grow up in media, but I've been really impressed by what a meritocracy it is and how passionate and dedicated and how the people lead with integrity and they lead with their common sense. And every one of you has that. So in the moments of darkness, um, you know, go to yourself and your own sense as Gretchen has shown in her career and her bravery, but you all have that intrinsically. You don't need us to tell you. And I just want to leave you with that because that's going to be your lighthouse um, throughout your life and certainly in this profession. So thank you again, Eli. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, just uh, to, to, to conclude a few thank yous. First to all of our panelists, you've been really fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed both hearing what you had to say this evening, which was super in insightful, but also you know speaking over Zoom earlier um, and having those those one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions. We're also we're also just I, I just really appreciate you giving your time for this, and and it's so cool to see this this come to fruition in this way. Um, next, Professor Whaley. Um, living with a law professor in the house, I know how busy your schedule must be, um, and and just that that you've taken the time to help me out with this and help Mr. Lovelato and help just the Tatler as a whole has been fantastic, um, and I, I really appreciated uh, just everything you've done um, to to make this possible. Um, then Mr. Lopalato and the Tatler as a whole, Mr. Lopalato, as, as people have already said, and as I'm sure most of you know, is just absolutely fantastic um, and, and does everything he can to make this possible um, and, and is just such a positive influence on the community. So thank you, Mr. Lopalato. Thank you to, to Ramey, especially, who helped organize this and to the Tatler as a whole um, for getting this done. Um, it, it's just been such a phenomenal experience working on the Tatler for the past two years. And this is just such a, such a great way um, to, to, to see my career in the Tatler evolve um, in senior year. And then, and then lastly, thank you to all the participants. We really appreciate you coming out and hearing what the panelists had to say. Um, and I, I hope you enjoyed yourself. So have a, have a lovely evening and enjoy your, oh, and, and also just quick shout out to the BCC 
um, education uh, f foundation, which the link I am putting in the chat. Um, definitely check that out and uh, please consider donating. Thank you in advance. Um, it helps support journalism at BCC and the BCC community as a whole. So we really appreciate that. Um, and then yes, thank you to all of our participants. Really loved having you here with us this evening. Um, and good night, everyone. <laughs>